Johannes Brahms was one of the great composers of the 19th century. He famously walked the line between classicism and romanticism and was a major player in the so-called War of the Romantics, a battle between the passionate and some would say histrionic music of Wagner and his acolytes like Bruckner and the more musically conservative and some would say backward looking Brahms and his followers. The funny thing about this war is that Wagner and Brahms admired each other. And even though they sometimes sniped at each other in the press, they really did enjoy each other's music. Now, one of the key facets of the War of the Romantics was that Wagner had declared that the symphony as a genre of orchestral music was dead. Beethoven was the last great symphonist, and now the only way forward was the Gesamt Kunstwerk, the total artwork encompassing music, drama, and a healthy dose of German myths. This happened to be the kind of music that Wagner was especially good at writing. Brahms, however, did not feel like the symphony was finished, though, like so many other composers, he felt practically crushed under the weight of what Beethoven had accomplished with the symphony. Brahms knew that the most concrete way he would be compared to Beethoven would be through his symphonies. And so he pretty much avoided writing one for a really long time. It's not like he didn't try. Brahms, when he was 21 years old, started sketching out his first symphony. But usually he abandoned these sketches and often burned them. This would go on for 22 more years until 1876. Brahms was 43 when he finally completed his first symphony and it was worth the wait. What Brahms came up with would inspire symphonists to this day, would carry on the tradition that Beethoven laid out with both a respectful and loving look back into the past with a clear eye towards the future. Coming up, we'll talk all about this spectacular symphony. But first, we need to take a look and a listen to two pieces that Brahms wrote before the first symphony. One of them actually almost became his first symphony. It certainly sounds like a symphony, doesn't it? This is the beginning of Brahms's first piano concerto, a piece that started out as a sonata for two pianos, then almost became a symphony, and then became a piano concerto. Though it is certainly one of the most symphonic piano concertos there is, the orchestra plays a role that is almost as important as the piano soloist. That terrifying moment of the concerto was inspired by the moment that Brahms heard the news that his good friend Robert Schumann, the wonderful composer, had attempted suicide by jumping into the Rhine River. Brahms had avoided writing a symphony, in this case, by transforming this piece into a piano concerto. And through the following years, he would make experiments with orchestral music, but he still wouldn't take the plunge into a symphony. He wrote two serenades, light music for orchestra. And he also wrote a set of variations on a theme that was thought to be by yet another Austro-German master, Joseph Haydn. These are the Haydn Variations, a piece much, much less dramatic than either the first piano concerto or what would become the first symphony. So he had done his experimenting, his working out of all the problems he could envision in the symphony, and finally, 
finally he had a symphony to send to his closest friend, Clara Schumann, the widow of Robert. Clara and Brahms had a relationship so complicated with so many twists and turns that I really think a movie should be made about it. But as I said, Brahms went through about a dozen different iterations of this symphony. And now as we begin dissecting the piece, let's take a look at how Brahms originally started it. <laughs> It's back to the dramatic and powerful energy of the first piano concerto. It's also very abrupt and violent and seems to throw us into the main action of the piece without any warning. We have to come back to this music because Brahms realized that there just wasn't enough of an entry point into the symphony. And so he wrote a long introduction. And if you think the music you just heard was dramatic, wait until you hear this. Would you believe that that music, that music that is full of struggle and even agony, will result in this 40 minutes later? but we're going to have to earn it to get to that glorious moment. For now, let's head back to the very beginning of the piece and try to figure out how Brahms is able to portray such agony and desperation in the music. Throughout the concert today, I'm going to take things apart and then put them back together again in order to try and show you the building blocks of how Brahms crafts such a remarkable piece. Let's start with the rhythm right at the top of the piece, pounding away in the timpani, double basses, and the contrabassoon. This rhythm has been interpreted as fate. And while Brahms never explicitly said it was that, I don't disagree. Brahms puts two different ideas on top of this inexorable rhythm. The first is in the woodwinds and the violas. But against this, Brahms gives the violins something completely different. They play long notes that change on the quote, wrong beat of the bar. Now I conduct this music in six beats to the bar. The strong beats of a measure in six are on one and on four, which is exactly where the winds of the violas change their notes. But as you will see in the first page of my score, the violins keep changing on the weak parts of the bar, the sixth beat and the third beat. This is what is called syncopation and it plays a massive role in Brahms' music. When the music opposes itself in this way, the pounding of the timpani juxtaposed against the wind melody and the violin syncopation, it creates the sound of struggle in music. All of it together creates a beginning like nothing else.
one of Brahms's favorite things to do throughout the symphony is to write music that is off of those strong beats of the measure. In this next passage of the introduction, Brahms introduces two new ideas, stasis and then a powerful sense of longing in the music. In both instances, he has the orchestra play off of the beat, first in the winds and then in the strings. Watch how I conduct this passage and listen to the way the orchestra kind of bounces off of the beat. It's hard to portray this without seeing it, but the music is infused with just a little bit of instability thanks to the way Brahms writes it. The introduction lays out these two polar opposite ideas, the terrifying desperation of the opening and music full of quiet yearning. Brahms' music is often described as autumnal, and we'll get more into that in the second movement. But for now, let's go to the first big section of the first movement, the exposition. For those of you not familiar with the term exposition, let me very briefly explain to you a very important concept in classical music called sonata form. Sonata form is the basis for almost every symphonic first movement and many last movements all the way through the music of the late 19th century. It features an exposition featuring one, two, or three themes, a development where the theme or themes are twisted around and sometimes taken apart and put back together again, and then a recapitulation where the main theme comes home in the home key, and often a coda where everything is summed up. We've heard the introduction, now we're going into the exposition of the first movement. This is that gruff, abrupt music that we heard before. And what Brahms does here is amazing. Remember how he put two different ideas above that pounding timpani rhythm in the introduction? Well, here he's going to do exactly the same thing. First, we have a propulsive rhythm in the second violins, violas, and horns. And then we have two themes, a more on the beat theme in the cellos, And then the violins play a theme that relies more on the weak part of the beat. Put it together and Brahms is writing again, two different themes over a propulsive rhythm and the music drives along.
So remember sonata form? Well, in most sonata form movements, we have two contrasting themes in the exposition. But Brahms isn't going to make this too easy for us. And the next section of the exposition is actually fairly unclear as to where the second theme is. Usually in a movement like this, we would have a more lyrical and beautiful second theme to go with that gruff first theme. But Brahms seems content to just ride along with different fragments of themes rather than settle on just one. We have this theme. Which is sort of a more lyrical version of the first theme than this one, which passes itself around the woodwind section. and then this one, which actually takes us straight to the end of the exposition. Which theme was the second theme? Well, it turns out it was all of them and none of them at once. Brahms's big revolution here was putting his two contrasting themes on top of each other right at the beginning of the exposition. Everything else that comes after is either a variation on the offbeat theme or the on the beat theme. Listen to this section again so you understand what I mean, where the music mirrors the emphasis towards the downbeat, like in the cello version of the on the beat theme, until it reverses and becomes more obsessed with offbeats, like in the violin version, and it goes back and forth and back and forth again. <laughs> So what Brahms is doing here is something that the great and controversial composer Arnold Schoenberg called developing variation, but I like to call it continuous development. Brahms laid out two themes simultaneously, and now he's working his way through them, constantly developing them. And in the actual development section, Brahms does even more. It's the same story, except he employs even more drama in order to work out these two themes. <laughs> Now, a couple of things happen. First, Brahms starts to bring out a new rhythmic idea. Ba -ba -ba -bum. Does that sound familiar? Yes, that's Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. So Brahms, composing in the shadow of Beethoven, makes a reference to him. But more importantly, Brahms then changes directions and almost intentionally rejects the Beethoven V so-called fate motif. In a stunning moment, the orchestra now begins a pitched battle between the Beethoven V motif and a new chorale-like idea that shows off Brahms's beloved singing style. This battle will not be resolved easily.
The music finally dies down, but Brahms now has to take us back to the recapitulation, and he does so from absolutely nothing. The Beethoven V motif rises from the dead, and in one of Brahms's most dramatic moments, we return back to the gruff and defiant music of the exposition. This movement is exhausting, a dramatic and desperate introduction followed by this battle between defiance and warmth. Surprisingly though, warmth wins out and the music finally comes to rest, though throughout the entire final bars we hear the rumbling away in the horns and timpani, that four note Beethoven V motif. Things are by no means resolved as we come to the end of this massive first movement. Brahms was now faced, as all symphonic composers were and are, with a choice. Should he use a slow movement for his second movement? Or should he write a dance movement, like a minuet or a scherzo? I think Brahms realized that after such an intense first movement, we needed a break. And so he places the slow movement here, a remarkably warm and kind-hearted movement that emerges as if it had already been there, and we just turned up the volume. One very important thing that comes into play during the second movement is Brahms's use of two against three rhythms. Don't know what I mean? Here's how this works. First, let's hear the first violins play this passage. Do you hear that, how they play in big groups of two notes? Di da 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 da. Well, now listen to the cellos and basses. They're playing in groups of three notes. 
So when you hear the two together, you get a rhythm that comes out something like this. Brahms often wrote two against three rhythms, even in movements like this, which are full of warmth. Now, why did he do this? One of the theories about why Brahms wrote two against three is that every time he thought of his doomed relationship with Clara Schumann, he wrote two against three because it never quite could work out together. Now, I don't think that Brahms was that obvious with his symbolism, but I get the idea. Either way, when you listen to Brahms, always look out for two against three rhythms. They are everywhere. As the movement goes on, Brahms writes one of his most breathtaking melodies, an oboe solo that floats over the texture, loving, yearning, and majestic all at once. But this movement is not without despair. After the oboe solo, the music seems to acquire a kind of lightness and lilt. Listen to the second violins and violas who provide an elegantly dancing rhythm. But soon the first violins playing off the beat as they love to do in this symphony lead us to catastrophe. All of the warmth of the opening moments of the movement and the kindness of the oboe solo is lost and we are cast back into the desperate longing of the very beginning of the first movement. Brahms was a man prone to bouts of sadness. He once wrote to a friend, quote, I would have to confess that I am a severely melancholic person, that black wings are constantly flapping above us. In this next passage, Brahms brings back his favorite method of a syncopated rhythm to accompany a lonely oboe solo, followed by a much more consoling clarinet. These two facets of Brahms's personality, the melancholic and the consoling, come out constantly in his music. And I find this next passage one of the most touching in the entire symphony. Brahms goes through more intense drama before finally returning home to the warmth of his opening theme, but he does it using fragments that pass around the orchestra. Remember, this was Brahms's first symphony, but he had already had a lot of experience with orchestration due to his experiments in his earlier pieces. This is a ravishing bit of orchestration that melts us back into the comfort of the main theme.
now we arrive at one of the most famous moments of the piece, a violin, oboe, and horn solo that takes the beautiful melody that the oboe played at the beginning of the movement and makes it soar. This is the mood with which we will end this movement. For the third movement, Brahms decided to try something completely new. There was always a tradition of a dance movement within a symphony. Haydn, the father of the symphony, wrote minuets, courtly dances that are as elegant as they are charming. Beethoven, who was always pushing the boundaries, bumped up the tempo of the minuet, made it much more exciting, and renamed the minuet a scherzo, meaning literally a joke. Brahms, as I said at the beginning of the show, wasn't always a forward thinker, at least on the surface. But he actually was more revolutionary than his critics would give him credit for. Instead of writing a scherzo, Brahms reinvented the dance movement again and wrote an intermezzo. The intermezzo, as its name might suggest, is more of an interlude. It's not as fast as a minuet or a scherzo, and it doesn't really dance either. Instead, Brahms keeps us in that autumnal mood with a beautiful and gently flowing clarinet solo, which is marked to be played sweetly and gracefully. There is something both very carefree and slightly sad about this movement. It gently meanders along, both loving and nostalgic at the same time. Two words that describe Brahms's personality. One of Brahms' great loves was so-called Hungarian gypsy dances. He wrote dozens of classicized versions of them for both piano and for orchestra. And there is one moment where that character suddenly appears in this symphony. Listen to the clarinet, once again accompanied by an offbeat rhythm in the strings. The music without warning suddenly takes on a new character. But as quickly as it comes, it disappears. And Brahms moves us into the middle section of the intermezzo, usually called a trio section. This is elegant and stately music, full of singing and a sense of good cheer. To get back home to that beautiful clarinet melody, Brahms will do something that we need to keep in mind for the last movement. Listen to the way that Brahms emphatically brings us back to the main theme, using pizzicato or plucked strings. <laughs> Thank you. 
remember that moment. For now, though, Brahms leaves us to enjoy a brief reminiscence of the trio section before we drift off to sleep. With his fifth symphony, Beethoven completely flipped the script when it came to the symphonic journey. Throughout Haydn and Mozart's time, symphonies were structured with the first movement as the main course, the main argument of the symphony, which was usually resolved by the end of that movement. The second movement would be an often heartfelt slow movement, and then we would be given kind of two desserts with a dance movement and then a fast and thrilling finale. Well, in Beethoven's fifth, he completely shifted the focus of the menu. The first movement would leave a tension that needed to be resolved in the last movement of the symphony. That darkness to light formula would become incredibly popular for composers writing symphonies. And Brahms, in yet another homage to Beethoven, will follow that formula to a T in this massive and massively ambitious last movement. First, he starts us off with a huge two-part introduction. All of the lightheartedness from the previous two movements is instantly shattered by an attack from nearly the whole orchestra. This devastation is followed by the same pizzicato that served as a warning in the third movement. It starts almost catatonically, completely broken, until it is awakened and begins to rise up. This is both incredibly dramatic and incredibly revolutionary music in that the tempo does not remain stable. Brahms tells the orchestra to speed up, as if our hearts are beginning to race. Before we move on, remember that theme that the violins play right at the start of the movement. Now we will try again to rise. Two times, Brahms brings the orchestra back to its feet with a kind of boiling rage. But each time the music rises, it is smashed down again until the timpani, the drums, violently tear apart the fabric of the orchestra and all seems lost. Here is the moment that makes this symphony. In 1868, eight years before Brahms finished the symphony, Brahms sent a postcard to Clara Schumann with a theme sketched out on it. Brahms told Clara that it was the melody of a shepherd's alphorn in Switzerland. He wrote to her, quote, high on the mountain, deep in the valleys, I greet you a thousand times. This letter was sent at a precarious time in Brahms and Clara Schumann's friendship. Brahms wasn't a very easy man to get along with, and Clara was never shy about telling him that. 
He had just apologized for one of his worst offenses when he sent this theme to her, perhaps as a peace offering. Little would Clara know that eight years later, Brahms would write this glorious moment into his first symphony. Perhaps Brahms needed to break the music that comes before this so that Clara could put it back together again. Brahms uses one more device before setting up the main theme of the last movement. It's a chorale, and remember this moment as well. That moment is notable for a couple of reasons, but one of them is that Brahms has waited until this moment to use the trombones in his symphony, just like Beethoven did in his fifth symphony, waiting until the last movement to bring in the trombones. Now all of the elements are in place for the main part of the movement to actually begin. And Brahms writes a melody that might sound a little bit familiar to you. Does that sound perhaps like another famous theme? When the similarities between Beethoven's Ode to Joy and this theme in the last movement of Brahms' symphony were pointed out to Brahms, he famously responded, well, any jackass can see that. Brahms didn't shy away from these homages, clearly. He wanted to clearly acknowledge Beethoven's mastery before striking out on his own path. But even the theme itself has its own distinctive Brahmsian characteristics. The warmth of the string writing is something Beethoven never would attempt. And the tempo, not too fast, but with energy, is the perfect Brahms contradiction. And remember those very opening bars that I had the violins play alone? Well, Brahms now has used that desperate moment as the building blocks of his theme. Listen again to those first few notes the violins play at the beginning of the movement. And now when you listen to the main theme, that Beethoven 9 inspired theme, you'll hear those first four notes now transposed into something glorious and warm. As I said, Brahms is going to strike out on his own during this movement and leave Beethoven's influence behind. 
After another iteration of the main theme, Brahms ratchets up the tempo of the movement again, and we are thrust into the heat of battle. All of the elements from the first movement are present again, opposing rhythms, syncopations, and more. But now, with the added rush of 16th notes that bring us even more excitement and drive. <laughs> This is kind of a sonata form movement, and so Brahms needs a second theme. To do so, Brahms once again moves the tempo a bit faster, but he also uses slightly slower note values like quarter notes so that the music actually sounds slower even though the tempo is faster. But it's constantly also off the beat, meaning that we always lack a bit of stability. Again, watch how the orchestra bounces off of my downbeat in this passage. Now, this movement is not as easy to follow as other sonata form movements, so I recommend that you follow motifs and ideas, not the usual rigid structure of sonata form. For example, this theme in two is a good idea to follow as the movement goes on. And this one as well, a triplet motif. The winds will then take on the triplets. These two themes will come together, two against three again, in a thrilling moment. Brahms has built all of these ideas into the first three movements of the symphony so that they make sense when they arrive here, even if the structure of the movement is a little bit diffuse. By following the motifs and the idea of two against three, you'll never get lost in this movement. The development section will run almost exclusively on motifs. Remember those driving 16th notes from the exposition? Well, now they're flying back and forth between the string sections, between the violins and the violas, cellos, and basses, and back again. This music is boiling over with excitement. We also have a little reminder of the main theme of the movement, which is a reminder of the very opening notes of the movement. Remember, dee da dee dum. Now listen to the winds in this short passage. 
These fragments are just like ships passing in the night. It's almost hard to keep up with them. And as the movement reaches its climax, all of these ideas from the whole piece start to come together. Like we are driving into a tunnel full of them. The driving 16th notes, the theme fragment, the syncopations, the offbeats, two against three, all of it, until we are thrust into catastrophe. <laughs> and soon we are on the way to the coda of the movement. Brahms needs a spectacular coda to cap off this spectacular piece. First, he collects everyone using stretched out versions of the main theme, all while 16th notes scatter through the upper strings. And then he begins to speed up the tempo. There's a lot going on here, and it's not easy to manage this acceleration, not for me or for the orchestra. Watch how I have to conduct faster, little by little, all while most of the music is off the beat or syncopated. This is an excerpt usually for conducting auditions, and it can be a kind of harrowing moment. <laughs> There's one more decision that a conductor has to make when working on this symphony. At the true climactic moment, the trombone chorale from earlier on returns in a blazing fortissimo. Here, Brahms lets everyone sing out in full glory. Here's how it sounds, one of the best moments in all of classical music. <laughs> That's basically how Brahms wrote it. There's no change in tempo and it blazes away. But many conductors, especially in the past, liked to broaden things out here and take a lot of time. It certainly adds to the grandeur of the moment. <laughs> Which do you prefer? Honestly, I like them both. And so depending on my mood, I'll sometimes do it one way one night and another way the next. Whichever way you choose, the music flies off to the end of this symphony. Brahms has conquered his symphonic demons emphatically, and we get to enjoy every moment of it. Brahms quickly realized he was pretty good at writing symphonies, and so he wrote three more before his death in 1897. Brahms's music is profoundly rewarding. It is exciting thrilling, 
warm, loving, nostalgic, sad, tragic, and joyous, sometimes all at once. He is the master of complex emotions in music, and there's nothing like sitting in a concert hall and listening to a Brahms symphony. So the next time you have a chance, take a listen to this enigmatic master composer. Listen to his contradictions, his complex emotions, his rhythmic games, and on top of everything, the warmth and glow that his music possesses in every single note. <laughs> Okay. Um.